judge either way. Do, do, do. All right, so welcome to today's garden class, online students. We wish you were here at Waters Garden Center, but if not, we're glad you tuned in. Today's garden class is on growing wildflowers, the easiest gardening ever. So my name is Ken Lane. I'm the owner of the garden center. So I'm the second generation owner. So Waters Garden Center has existed for 60 years. My father-in-law, Harold Waters, started the business back in 1962. So we're gonna celebrate March 11th to 12th, that weekend, this, the weekend before spring, official start of spring. We're gonna, we're inviting our growers in, we're doing some special growth, I mean, 60 years. That's a long time, we gotta do something. I'm trying to get Harold and Lorna are still alive. They're still going. They're in their mid to late 80s now. Uh, and he could tell a story better than anyone back in old Prescott. So I want to capture some of those, maybe air them on the radio show, that kind of stuff, trying to capture some that's company history. And I know I don't have a lot of years left to capture those. So I want to take advantage of that. So we'll have some special things that we have. But that's kind of our story. Uh, my wife works here. I've got two daughters that work here. We've got two dogs, actually three family dogs that work here. You know, it's a family business, so it's very much local, yokel. Uh, and we just grow with the comp with the uh, the company grows as the community grows. So that's just kind of who we are, what we do. We are famous for our plants. We're noted as a place where our plants just grow. So you buy them other places like box stores. Stay away from that orange beast. Uh, so where they you put them in, and then they struggle or they look at you and they mock you they don't grow they just or they die that kind of stuff uh and then wildflowers is really specialized uh a, a thing to watch with wildflowers can i can't hear myself in the mic the speakers are set back farther is it okay you got it you can hear me okay well good i just like to hear myself you know it's kind of a weird thing i guess if i could i have a big monitor there where i can watch myself but no that's a sickness anyway okay so uh, where is that even at? Wildflowers are really specialized. What you want to really be careful of, this is the shortcut in the industry, especially as we have inflation and stuff. They'll have this really pretty package, brightly colored wildflowers, and they'll put some seed in there, usually they're annuals. That is, they'll grow for a year and then they don't come back. They're just for this year and that's it. You want perennials. You plant them once and they keep reseeding, keep coming back, keep going. They just grow bigger and better. That's what you really want. But perennial seed are a little more expensive. And then they'll top off this beautiful package and put like a tablespoon or a thumbnail, you know, a teaspoon worth of seed in there. The rest of it's filler. Vermiculite, just different kinds of fillers in there. So really what you're buying is air with a few annual seeds. Just really research the label and know what you're getting. Uh, and you don't want a bunch of annuals. You want perennial flowers that are for high altitude mountains here, not desert stuff. So the desert plants, Phoenix, Palm Springs, Tucson. I mean, you folks, okay, let's see where everyone's from. That would be fun, wouldn't it? Who's, this is your first garden season here in, in, the, in the Central Highlands area. First year. Oh, half the crowd. Oh, that's good. Welcome to God's country. We're glad you're here. Now close the door. Keep everyone else out. It's kind of a Prescottonian thing. As soon as you say that, you know you're officially a Prescottonian. They've been saying it since the 60s when I grew up here. They're just all the time. Uh, how, where is everyone from? So what's the furthest away anyone's from? Anyone in New York? Mississippi's pretty good. Not quite far enough. Buffalo, New York. Okay, that's Niagara Falls, right? That area? Good. Indiana, Minnesota. Midwest is always represented. Why you would live... In that kind of cold, I don't know. What was that? Mocking in the back? Chicago. 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 England's pretty good. That'll do. Okay. Yeah, hell yeah. Where true gardeners come from. <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay, let's just get it over with. How many Californians? Okay, only half the crowd that are new. So they're always represented, but they're not from, not everyone's from California. Let's face it, Midwest is well represented as well. So they're from everywhere. Um, here it's different than anywhere else you've grown. And it's because the altitude makes the sun very intense, more intense. You'll feel that on your skin as you're hiking around or just out there. It burns you faster. 
It also burns plants faster. Also our soil, I don't know if you've tried to dig a hole in the ground, um, it's pretty rough. Uh, you folks out that 69 corridor, the, 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 the backside of Prescott Valley, oh, that's, I feel for you. I, I'm sorry for you, but bigger digging bar, bigger jackhammer, makes the hole go in the ground. Uh, this is the only place you've lived where you have caliche, where this layer, this, this light colored layer of, of basically cement in the ground. It's a, it's a soil band, and if you hit it, you've got to break it. You've got to chisel through it so the soil will drain. So that's, that's a unique thing here. That and the most insidious of all of them, that you don't even see it, your water is super alkaline. This is very unusual. It's a little tiny bubble here in the Southwest where you've got really alkaline water. Your soil is alkaline, everything's alkaline. The rest of the country is acid. So they're always trying to add lime to the soil, increase the pH, make it more, less acidic, more alkaline. Don't ever listen to anyone from Chicago <laughs> or their garden advice, at least, because they're, they're dealing with acid stuff. You kind of want, want to do the opposite of that. So we're adding soil sulfur, not lime. Not lime. You ever heard lime sweetens the soil? Not here. Here it kills the soil. And so anytime you come in and ask you for lime, we know you've read a magazine. It was pretty. They said, do this. This is a recipe for great gardens. And I need the lime. That's what I need for the recipe. I'm going to question you going, uh, are you sure you really need that? So do a, do, a, do a pH test first. That's unique. You'll adjust to that as you make a few mistakes. You kind of go, oh, that didn't quite work. You, do, you should do the opposite. And so that's why you're here. Hopefully we're going to help you take three steps forward so that you can take one step back and still be ahead of the game. So we want you at least making mistakes in the right direction. That's the goal of our garden classes. And so wildflowers, we make four blends and I put them in a baggie just so I could pass them around. If you're comfortable, you can pass them or look at them. If not, let them pass. But you can see the differences. And, and I've got four, four blends that we make. This is probably the most famous. This is called Parade of Poppies or California Poppies. That's that orange one about this big. It's about this tall. And you'll see fields of them. Um, but orange by itself is kind of boring. So now you've got red and white and a whole bunch of different kinds. We, we blend a bunch of different colors of poppies in the same blend, but they all act the same way. Kind of, they've kind of got some weight to them, some girth. Kind of take me to pass them back, however you, I'll pass the next one over here. Some of them like this one, this is a uh, deer and rabbit resistant because we've got so many of you that are interfacing with the, the forest. The deer are just ravenous. They're coming in and eating, the, the rabbits will come in and eat your flowers, your plants, your trees. And so we made a blend that's, that's those plants where they're less prone. We, say, we use the word resistive because if they're desperate and they're just super hungry, they'll tend to eat anything just to keep because they're starving. But if there's anything else available, they'd rather leave these alone. So. Well, we, we, we blend up a shotgun and put it into the mix so that, you know, there, there are certain flowers that they don't like, things that have thick stems, leathery uh, uh, leaves. Uh, there, there's, a, there's defenses that, that plants put onto them, like, the, like a fuzz, fuzzy back uh, leaf or, or fuzzy stems, where when they start to eat it, it gets in their throat and they're kind of going, oh, oh God, I need some water. Those are plants have are brilliant, actually. They've been perfecting their resistance for millennia, and these are the ones that have kind of perfected it more. So that, that's, that's actually a good question. Why are some plants resistant and others are delicious? Some are, yes? So, so, so the deer and rabbit, rabbit resistive list or mix um, are how do, how, do, how do animals know they don't want it? Quite honestly, deer don't know. They'll start eating it because they're just like a cow. They've got two stomachs. They'll start digesting. Then they kind of go, oh, this is making me feel sick before they process more. So they'll kind of graze and nibble on a few and then go, ick, and then keep moving on. So they might nibble a little bit, but generally speaking, they can smell, taste, hear. They're just like, how many people love artichokes? 
I despise artichokes. Please don't have me over and serve them. I won't eat them. I don't like them, says Sam. I am. I just am not going to eat them. Uh, so they know which ones they like or don't like, too. Some of you don't like broccoli. Some of you like cabbage. Some of you don't. They're the same way. What I, what I wanted you to take a look at with this one is take a close look at the different kinds of seeds. Some of them are as light as a feather. They're really fine. Uh, some of them are made to catch the wind and blow down the valley. So that's a good mix. You're getting some wild seed in there. But some of them are so fine, you can hardly tell where they've hit the ground. I'll, I'll share a secret on how to deal with that later. But I just want you to get a feel for what does that look like. Okay, and then the last one is the Arizona mix. This one I made 20 years ago. Just kind of a little bit bigger. If you care for them at all, they're going to thrive and they're a little bit bigger, showier flowers. Some of them are, are deer resistive. Some aren't as much. It's made to be showy, first and foremost, pretty and easy, easy to care for. Most of these are, I guess I got to go this way on this one, huh? So you'll see a mixture in, in the texture and the changes, the seeds change, the percentage change. These are recipes we're putting together for, for looking good. Uh, January is your time to put them in. You want to put these in by, you want to get your wildflower gardens in by middle of March. End of March at the latest, when you're really desperate. You need this freeze and thaw cycle. These seeds, especially that parade of poppies, you see how heavy that hull is on those seed? They need to go through this freeze and thaw cycle to crack that hull or scarify or open up the, the seed so it can actually germinate and go in the ground. If it's too warm, they just won't, they'll sit there and they won't germinate. They'll sit until they get the right weather where they can crack open and start to grow. So that's why you'll see some years, certain wildflowers go crazy and the next year, they're not as prevalent. They aren't as pretty as they were the year before. The season out, the changes in the environment will change how they react. Once they get going, they'll just reseed and keep going for years. So uh, last year's class, I took the seed and I spread it over in my a garden across the street, one of my test gardens, and the entire thing was nothing but butterflies and hummingbirds the entire rest of the year through about Thanksgiving. Then finally they started to kind of die, the cold got to them. They, now they're hibernating underground right now. They're starting to come back up, but they aren't blooming yet. So, but you can see that the poppies, they're already up this tall. They're already growing. You know, so are your dandelions. The weeds are starting to show up already. So it's been warm enough and moist enough where things are starting to happen. They're slow, but you can see as a gardener, you can see the, a hint of spring starting to happen. Okay, so things you're gonna need when you do wildflowers, I should pass out the handout because I've got a couple things. One, I know I did not have enough of those wild, the uh, uh, how to how to feed handouts. Oh, awesome, Michelle, so good. That's good. And then this is the wildflower handout. It's a one-page handout. I'll make sure you get the actual notes for this in your inbox by the end of the day. So give me your email address. It'll be there now. If you're already part of our cool garden club. It's not going to all 11,000 of you. It's only going to you, not everyone. So if you want that, give me your email address. It'll be there to, by the end of the day. It'll be in your inbox. And I was looking at my mums, and they're starting to grow. So the mum, last year's chrysanthemums, they're up about this tall. You can see the old leftover blooms. The snow sort of made them look kind of ratty looking. I was looking down in there, and they're starting to grow. I thought I'd do a quick sample just for our garden club members. This will probably be to everyone, but I'll make sure you're on that list. Uh, they're starting to grow. How do you prune that back and why do you wait? Just a real quick 90 second lesson on how to prune chrysanthemums just because it's time for me to print to, to prune back my chrysanthemums. So I'll just send that to you. It might even be an Instagram link or something easy to just share broadly. So sometimes social media, I don't know what you feel about that, but for an entrepreneur, it's super easy to use. You pull your phone out, take a video, send. It's just so easy. Whereas YouTube is more arduous, kind of you got to print, you got to upload it, then you have to get the link and it's just more. So anyway, why do I digress like that? I just don't know. You know, if we go down questions like this, yeah, go ahead.
Yep. I gather that's a theme for the students. That's good. So javelina, yeah, how about javelina? Javelina are a challenge in that they're basically a wild pig. They're not truly a pig. They're a, anyway, they're rodents. But basically, they've got a root where they, a nose where they root things up. And so they might be in your gardens. They don't care about the plants whatsoever. They're rooting it up. They almost have a rototiller effect to see what's underneath. They're after the worms, the grubs, the protein source underneath. Some of your wildflowers, they might be after the roots, but usually not these. They're after the insects in the soils. So they'll be attracted to your gardens, not because they want your plants. Sometimes they'll... I think they play soccer or something sometimes, back and forth, just to kick them around. Uh, they're mainly looking in the that, that soft, easy-to-turn soil. And they know that gardens attract worms and other insects. So they're going to be attracted to that. If you've got a lot of heavy activity, what I do, I just put a grub killer down in my gardens so they're less attracted to come in there. So grubs are those great big white C-shaped worms. Uh, they love to eat roots on your plants. They're, they are delicious for you and I. Some, some folks roast them, skew them, eat them. I don't, but uh, some do. They're, they kind of have a sweet like bacon flavor. If you believe that, no, don't believe that. But but to, to javelina, they like them. So that's that's why. So the only way to really keep a javelina out, fence it. That's the only way. I use a 12-volt electric fence, one foot off the ground. That's what I do. So my HOA, I'm not allowed to have a fence in the front. So at night, I go out and I put some rebar things in and I turn the wire down so no one can see me do it because I know the HOA Nazi is going to come in and go, you know, you can't do that. And then I spray paint, I camoed it so you couldn't see it. Because I don't want to see, I don't want to see a wire either. I don't want to see that, but I want to keep the javelina out. And all the neighbors, yesterday they came by and went, your yard always looks so good. Well, let me tell you how. It's electric fence, one foot off the ground, it keeps the javelina out. So that's kind of, that's kind of my secret. Got a whole class and nothing but that. The things you'll need. Let me take a sip. So the things you will need to do wildflowers, you need your seed, obviously. Don't make the blunder of taking your seed. I don't know if you've seen the price of wildflower, a good wildflower seed. It's like gold. It's a really good mix. You want them all to germinate. You don't want any waste. You want them all to go. And so you don't want to just chuck them out over the riprap on the side of the driveway. Some will come up. Maybe 5% will come up. The rest is going to be wasted. Why, why do that? We can show you how to get 100%. Hey, Ken, you know what? I think it's warm enough in here, you think? Can we turn those off? Or at least, or at least I'm, yeah, I'm having it. I'm, I'm, I'm warm and, uh, and I'm, I, really? You want him to keep it on? Keep the back one on. How about that? And then this one off. That'll work. We'll comp. We'll compromise. There we go. You know I own the greenhouse. I can do what I want. <laughs> I know. You're the reason I own the greenhouse. <laughs> okay, so where was I at? you need the seed. Um, don't just throw them over the over the edge. You really do want to protect them. Right now the birds are hungry. You're gonna. You could actually put out the world's most expensive bird seed. You just don't want that. So there's ways to protect them. I'll show you how to do that. Um, things you're going to do that, you need a bag of mulch. So it looks like this. So, and I've already put some in here. So this is uh, basically compost from a old sawmill over in Taylor, Arizona. We kind of harvest that, screen it down, and that's what it is. So it looks kind of rich and thick, and it smells not like manure. Don't use manure. You'll burn your seedlings up. A compost or a mulch is what you want, okay? Maybe a topsoil. Uh, potting soil is overkill. This mulch, mulch is what you want to use, okay? I threw a half a bag in there just so it's easier for me to work. Um, you'll also need all-purpose plant food. This is what's going to make them grow and, and, and bloom and get up there fast. Get them, get them growing so that you get blooms this year. If you don't do this, it'll keep growing. It just won't bloom as nice this year. It'll bloom really great next year. This one extra step will make them bloom right now. Again, this is all going to be in this handout. You note takers, you can come up and look at this later, but 
you'll have this in your inbox here shortly. Um, uh, I'll, the recommended amount, I'll, I'll tell you in a sec. Um, Humec, I use this for any seedlings. Anytime you start a lawn, a vegetable garden, a flower garden, which is what this is, use Humec. What Humec does, it activates the, the soil mycorrhizals and, and, and the beneficials inside the soil, it activates the soil. And when seedlings see that soil is active and alive, it goes, whoa, it's all got to be good. I should send out deeper roots. So it encourages deeper roots within your plants, especially seedlings. This is all about roots. And you want as much roots as you can before June, which is when it gets hot. It just gets hotter. It's just 90 degrees, and it's a wind, and it's dry. That's when you got to watch them. So it helps them get deeper roots. Um, and then for me, I add a, it's called Aqua Boost Crystals. These are water-holding polymers, and they, uh, they actually will swell up. Oh, I didn't know it would do all that kind of death. Sorry about that. Here we go. Yeah. So anyway, let me see if I can turn this. It won't. And then give me one of those bags of seed. I would like, let me have the Arizona mix. If someone's got that. We got them all up here. What are you pointing at? Oh, oh, that's good. If you got whichever one, I love it. Let me, let me mix out. That'll be perfect. And I'm not going to do this whole thing. Um, we, we sell them by quarter cups, and one scoop will go 100 square feet. So this is like, I don't know, 2,000 square feet. It's like a huge amount of wildflower seed. So I think I'm just going to take like a handful and mix those in. And the reason that I'm mixing them into mulch, this is, I'm creating my own hydro mulch. Basically is what's happening. You can do this on your own. Some of these seeds are so tiny, I spread them, and I can't see if I've, did I get the coverage right? Is it spread out? Is it even? You don't want it clumping up. You want it to be as even as you can. Well, this little technique does two things. Does three things. It allows me to see where I've spread them. It hides the seed from the birds. So now it's in the mulch. It kind of settles down. Once you water, it'll all kind of come together. And then it ensures that my seed have better seed to soil contact. So I have better I have better germination rate. So you get threefold benefit by doing it this way. Mainly I started doing this years ago just so I could see where to spread them out there in the gardens. It's what it, but there's so many more benefits than just that. I've put uh, in here, this is my seed. This is my aqua boost. The aqua boost will soak well up and, and hold. What the heck is that rock doing in there? That's, we must be towards the, it's this huge, sawdust tailing pile it's probably a 15 year supply i've got at the bottom of the pile we dig that's our top soil it's all the finer sediments go towards the top towards the bottom this is the this is the top end of that huge uh it's an old sawmill just old sawdust so it's compost over like 40 50 years and we're harvesting that someone must have gotten a rock in there anyway so i'll blend all that up now i'm not going to put my fertilizer in here in the mix, I'm just trying to get it mixed up. Can you see that on the camera? There you go. This is just for you folks on on Facebook. I think we have LinkedIn in here too. Anyway, there we go. Now all of a sudden you can't see the seed at all. It's just disappeared. But you can see where to spread this. And usually I'll spread this by hand. Sometimes if I'm doing a big garden, I'll take my shovel and kind of just try to get it out as, as, as even as I can. Um, don't just spread this mix now onto soil that's been unkept or on just virgin soil, weeds and everything else. Go ahead and take a moment. I'll usually take a stiff kind of rake and I'll just try to rake up or scarify or open up the earth, that garden section, so it can receive these seeds better. It gets rid of the top rocks, junk, the weeds, the logs, the things that are going to keep the seed from germinating. I'm going to rake that up as best I can. Then I'm going to spread this over that whole area. When I'm all done, I usually will take my, my rake. I'll turn it with the tines up where I've got that flat bar, basically. And I'll scooch it back and forth, mainly just to get it as even as I can. 
And then when I raked up that, that soil, it opened it up. It's got some opening, so it kind of blends it all together. I'll get, you'll get better take, better germination, better, a better flower garden by doing that. It's a, it's a game changer. It really, really works. There was a question about that, how to rake? Really? Oh, can you do containers with wildflowers? Yes, you can. I do a lot of containers. So can you put this with a, with a container? Yes, you can. They aren't quite, wildflowers are kind of, they're ugly when they're small. They just look kind of weedy. In fact, you got to tell your gardeners, don't mistake them for weeds or they're just coming out. They're starting to get about this big and they'll come and kill them all. Because uh, you're going, oh, that's a weed. It should be there. In another three weeks, it would have been in bloom and they wouldn't have said that. You just want to smack them, but uh, they, they aren't quite as, they don't have the sex appeal. You're not going to put them in the front of a magazine and go, wow, that's so pretty. Uh, at early. What you might do there is put an actual thing like this in the middle. This is a snapdragon. It thinks it's a wildflower. It recedes like crazy. But now you got something that looks really good, put your seed around with that. So you got kind of an anchor. So it looks good the first six, eight weeks when it's when it's going. But yes, you could do. I've seen a lot of raised beds with wildflowers. That's probably the most common. Uh, I grow I garden on mine just open open soil, just part of the garden I want it to be wild. There you go. And it attracts birds and hummingbirds. I just want to be, I want a wild section in my gardens. That's where the butterflies naturally are drawn to. Painted ladies, monarchs, swallowtails, all those guys. So all these seeds will do that, yeah. So they'll all attract that. Um, I like a blend of seed because some years, some flowers work better than others. So just the environment changes. There's more rain, there's more snow, there's different things that happen. So the poppies will be really pretty this year, but the next year, echinaceas are the show. Then it's the galardias. So a blend will help you get a broader mix and it extends the bloom cycle. So, po so poppies look really good in spring. They don't look that good in the fall. They kind of look rangy and kind of overgrown. But that's when your asters and your mums and these other things look really good. So if you get a blend, you extend your flower cycle. So this thing pulsates as it fades, the next thing comes into bloom. That's a benefit. So anyway, go with the blend, not a pure mix. Now for me, I really like penstemons. It's my favorite native flower. It's a flower that gets up about this tall. There's different types of penstemons. This is firecracker. You'll see this blooming, usually the end of February, March, you'll see this blooming out just as you walk around. Hummingbirds think they've died gone to heaven when you see this. So you don't have to just go with our blends. What I'll generally do is I'll go, I, plus, plus I'm a red guy. I like red. I don't know why. Um, but I usually will take a favorite flower that I kind of like. And I'll add that or supplement or add to my, my mix that I've already bought. And I'll just kind of go, I just want to front load it. Get every one of those babies out of there. I got a friend up in Colorado. He's a professor, but his hobby is collecting seed. And he started Beauty Beyond Belief. He's kind of an odd, he's an odd bird. Uh, anyway, he started this company, but they're truly wild seed. They're amazing. Uh, so these are actually packed. Oh, that's another thing to watch. This says packed for 2022. Did you know in the state of Arizona, you're not allowed to, I'm not allowed to sell you a seed that hasn't been tested in the last nine months for germination rate. It's really easy to do. You put it between some napkins, you put the seed out, you see how fast it germinates. If there are dead seeds in there and it can only, it's gotta be less than like 8%. There's a percentage, you gotta be within range. Don't buy old seed. You don't want it. Yes, I know the Egyptians are finding corn or wheat or whatever from 2000 years ago and it germinated, but that's a freak accident. You really want fresh, freshness is really gets you a, a healthier, better, more germination than an old seed. Some of your bigger things like beans and stuff, okay, they'll go for a couple of years, but still they lose vitality. You want fresh, young, vigorous seed in your when you're doing this. You're gonna do this kind of work. You kind of want it to be successful. So now I'm gonna blend this together. So I just wanted more pinstamen. And now I could go ahead, I've got my own mix. And this is what I would actually spread. 
Now, it's cold out. I think it's 22 degrees this morning. It's going to snow again. You know that, right? It's going to there's going to be frost. It's it's we live in the mountains. This is kind of what happens. That's what you want. That's why you're starting wildflowers now, not in May or June. That's the biggest mistake I find people make. Coming, oh, I'm new to the area. I'm from Palm Springs or Tucson, and I want wildflowers. I've seen these. My neighbors had them. Let me. I'm going to do them now. And they failed. So they started them in 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 basically late spring and summer, and, and they didn't go through that freeze and thaw cycle, and that some of the seed just didn't germinate. Didn't germinate. They're still there. They just might not come up until next year. And by then, we've forgotten they were there and we've gardened on to something else. So timing is everything with wildflowers. There we go. When I get this all spread, I'm going to, over top of this garden area, so this will probably cover this whole mix, two, 300 feet. So you want to get it as thin as you can go. Probably about a quarter inch thick is plenty for wildflowers. So spread it out. If you get a little clumping, that's why I turn that, that rake upside down, kind of scooch it back and forth. Just allows me to spread it out even a little bit further and to get it more evenly, evenly over that whole garden area. Pray for rain, pray for snow. That's the best thing. Last year, I put my seed on top of snow. Remember that snow last year? Those of you that were here, we had a, about a foot snow, actually more like a, a deeper snow. Uh, yeah, that late January. Um, I just put it on top of the snow. I went, I wonder if this will work. It was like magic. The only thing that would be better is if I could have gotten the seed on under the snow. That would have been even better, but it germinated to the seed. Top of the snow. As it melted, just kind of came down, percolated in. I was worried about the birds getting it on top of the snow because it's like glowing, come and eat me. But I think the mulch kept that from, it hid it. They couldn't find it as easily. So it really worked out well. So snow is your friend with wildflower seed. It really, really helps get it into the ground. Also, you'll notice as you freeze and thaw, um, the ground will actually, uh, will actually kind of expand and swell up. And so it actually will, 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 will actually swallow those seed better into the soil as it freezes and thaws. It almost gets a fluffy effect. And so that's a real benefit to wildflower seeds. It makes sure that it germinates. Make sure that the area that you're putting this on, you now created a garden. Don't put it on things you don't want. So if you've got tumbleweeds coming up everywhere, or goat head, or whorehound, or these nasty local weeds, um, as soon as you create a garden, they're going to start germinating too. So you want to really go through and handpick or get those weeds out of there. So that, and then I'll find that as I as they first come up, I'll kind of hand walk or walk through that garden area, pick out the things that I know are obviously weeds. Go, dandelion don't belong here. I'll kind of hand curate some of the weeds out of that garden bed, just to ensure that it's mainly going to be my seed. And that's, that's going to be the case. Okay. Yes. Aha, good question. So pre-emergent. Yeah. So should you put pre-emergent down before you put your seed down? No. Uh, and, and here is the reason why. So pre-emergents are like, it's like a, we've got it it's called turf and grass preventer is what it's called. A bag covers some crazy amount, five, 6,000 square feet of, of, of garden space. And it does work. It keeps seed from germinating. The problem with that is it keeps seed from germinating, including wildflower seeds. How long before? Generally what I'll do is I'll put... Like I'm, I've put my weed and grass preventer down in my gardens already because the, uh, ho the uh, uh, foxtail's already up. Dandelions are starting to grow. So the, weed, the winter weeds are starting to grow. I want this down before they germinate. It keeps the seed from germinating, not the weed. It doesn't kill weeds. It keeps the seed from germinating. So I want to get it down before the seed germinate. So I put that down on my gardens already, but not where my, my wildflowers are, not where the seed are. Now, the benefit is if you've already got a wildflower patch, you could put it on top of the plants and it will keep other weeds from germinating inside that wildflower garden or in a lawn, but it won't allow other seed to come in, blow in and, and germinate. I would say keep weed and grass preventers, keep the preventers away from your wildflower seed. It's nothing but problems down the road.
And what are you talking, 200 square feet? Do everything else, it's not here. Do it by hand, I would say. In the back. Yeah. Right on top, yep. So his question was, he's in Prescott Valley. Okay, let's face it, half the group's from, how many from Prescott Valley? Oh, not that, not as many, really? With pride, how many from Prescott Valley? Really, just, yeah. My first house was in Prescott Valley. I, I lived in Prescott Valley back when the roads were dirt. This is early 90s. They called it Jackass Flats. Uh, there was a houseboat on like 55 gallon drums out there. I mean, it, really, it was a it was a hokey place. They've all they've all grown up. Uh, anyway, uh, yes, you could put that right on the soil that's out there, and it will germinate. Again, open it up. You've got those that heavy clay where, when it rains. Like, I don't know where these potato-sized rocks just start emerging out of the, out of the ground. It's crazy. Um, it, try to get some of that top layer out of there if you can. Because if you put this on top of a rock layer, it'll, it'll heat up in summer. It'll, it becomes a little oven, and it will affect that plant that's around that rock. So just try to do a little bit of care. It makes a big difference. The biggest mistake I've seen is from Prescottonians. Uh, they've got these rocky riprap slopes. They've cut into the bank get their driveway up and they want wildflowers on the side of that bank and they just chuck the seed over. They come back and go, why didn't it work? It's all your fault. Oh, well, you didn't care enough to actually nurture the plants at all. Uh, so kind of open that, get it to soil. If you've got something like that, create little pockets in, in, that, in the side of that hill. Create, create little garden pockets, little mini raised beds. Put your seed on top of those little areas so you can have some definite spots where they'll take. Once they start seeding and growing and getting up there, they'll naturally start seeding and you'll just see, like the gallardias will just start spilling down the hill. They'll just start coming up. But nature does that with millions of seed. I mean, they, if you're going a hillside, only 5% of the seed germinated, but there were like millions of them. So by the time they get done, it still looks really good. You kind of want to get it started. Start, we're starting from scratch. Just start and it'll, it'll take from there. The other one, at the end of the year, I'm brutal with my wildflowers. I'll usually take a lawnmower or weed whacker or something really, really uh, that shakes up the seed because they've gone to seed. This usually December, late November, January, whenever, sometime in the winter. And I'm trying to mow them down and I'll just, I want to spread that seed everywhere. And so within that area. So weed whacker does really good. As you weed whack, it just goes shoom. And seed just go all over the yard. Just be careful because the seed will go all over the yard, including the place maybe you don't want. So that's kind of how I do it. I kind of take my lawnmower. I've got an electric plug-in lawnmower. I just kind of go out zzz, afternoon, and there you go. And I watch over them. If you really want them to go, spread a little bit of this mulch on top. After you get done uh, uh, cutting them back, spread a little bit of the mulch on top of it. You are going to have... You'll have three times the garden next year, next spring, as you did the year before, just because you've got so many more seed that naturally came up in your gardens, okay? On top of this, I'm going to add, I'm going to spread this, and I'm going to spread at the same time the fertilizer on top of the garden. And it does not matter which one goes, it doesn't matter. You could put this down before you spread the seed, after you spread the seed, it doesn't matter. Just put them on. And that'll ensure that you get better growth, better flowers uh, on your wildflowers. These are perennial seed. With perennials, typically, not typically, always, the second year of growth always looks better than the first year. You will get some flowers. It will be showy. But it'll only be about half of what the next year. The next year, because roots, the perennials take... They need a, a, an understructure, root structure underneath them to really show off. And one year's of root is not quite enough for them. They'll start to show, but the second year, that's the when they take that picture they put on the front of that uh, wallflower to show off this is what it looks like. It's always year two they take that picture, not year one. Just kind of, just so you know how kind of things work. That's also just, if you want to know why annual flowers are cheaper than perennial flowers, like a pansy. They're pretty inexpensive compared to, let's say, hollyhocks or gallardias or some of these others, echinaceas. 
It's because we've had to have those echinaceas at the farm for two years, sometimes five years. Perennials can be up to five years at the farm. How long does it take to hold a plant and grow it for years? Forever. How long does it take a pansy to grow? Six weeks. So it's just a speed thing, how fast they grow, and that's why. So these are all perennials. They're going to look best their second year. It's kind of plant pathology, why it happens. Okay, other questions? Not from Prescott Valley. How about up here? I'll come back to you. Oh, got you. How often should you water? So if you want to ensure wildflowers, here's how often you want. Here's what I do. This is my, my name's Ken. We're just friends. We're talking over the back fence, and this is kind of what works in my yard. I think it'll work in yours. Uh, what I do is I'll take a soaker hose, and I'll just lay it out there in that garden area, and I really fo and I'll turn it on. I'll let it run so I can see where the wet spots, you know, soaker hose typically about this far on either side of the soaker hose will be wet. I'll kind of spread, I'll, I'll focus this mix on those areas so I can ensure that they're healthier, better, stronger. We can have some really long dry spells here. What you don't want is your seedlings to start to come up, and then you go for two months with no moisture. That will affect your wildflowers. So if you could top it off every once in a while, a couple times a month, once, once every 10 days, that's enough to keep it going. You could, you could hand water it. You could do a, whatever traditional old-fashioned fan spray. I do a soaker hose just because it's easy, and I just run it through, through that way. So I'll keep my garden hose connected to it. I just kind of turn it on for half an hour, and it waters them. So I would say if you can garden with these and ensure that you nurture the seedlings, you'll get a better take. Otherwise, you're going to have the same natural cycle that we go through here natively. So in spring, you'll see beautiful wildflowers. Then about May through June, you see everything go brown, kind of stops blooming. Then the monsoons come, it starts to green back up, they go into bloom again. You can gap, you as a gardener can fill that gap and ensure those plants keep going and keep blooming. That's an easy way to do it. Yeah, good, good great question. Fresca Valley. Yeah, it's perfect, it's great, yeah. And they'll take the same, so his question, I know you folks online, I forget it, I forget the cameras there, don't wanna leave you out, uh, but you should come in and visit us, you know that, right? So, um, anyway, um, can you put wildflowers around a, a fruit tree as an underplanting, and would that work? It would actually work magically, because you're probably watering your trees once a week or so. Perfect for these. They will be absolutely glorious. They'll be glorious. Yeah, easy, easy, easy. Something over here? Yeah. Yeah. You can go, yes. How long, Once they're established, seedlings are up, can you just let them go? Yes, you can. It's just, again, you're going to have that same cycle uh, where it's going to go brown. And in typically June, the gardens look pretty rough unless you're watering them. And then the monsoons come and they just they grow like that really fast, so that, that same cycle. So just like you see on the side of the road, it's going to look like that. So you can fill that gap in. But yes, you can let them go totally. For you, I'd say for that, the Arizona mix is ideal. That's what it's made for. Yeah. I also have a couple wild grasses. So we made a... We have a lot of uh, uh, septic fields, scars of construction, basically. And so you open this, you just rip this property a new one. You kind of want it to go back to the way it was. We created a wildflower, gra uh, a wild grass. It's got wheat grass, blue grama grass, fescues. It's a lot of tall grasses, kind of gets it up, kind of like what you see on the side of the road. It's that. It's made to oversee, to recover from, from just scars of construction. Well, so many people were wanting that, and they wanted to put a meadow mix. They wanted to put a wildflower in that mix, but some of those taller grasses shade the flowers so much, they weren't blooming very well. So we called out all the short grasses. We made what's called a meadow mix. So it's Indian rice grass, I mean, shorter, shorter grasses, and then we put wildflowers in that. So now you've got grass and flowers in the same mix called a meadow mix. So we've actually got two more wild, mainly grasses. They're not made for mowing. It's not, a, it's not a lawn. It's made to be wild grass that you can grow out there too. That's not for everyone. 
there's a lot of big properties here that they need they need help that way. So down the driveway, that kind of stuff. So okay, yes, yeah. Uh, who have I not gotten to? How long do seeds last? As far as how do they grow? How long do they grow out in the yard? Oh, so, okay, gotcha. So the question is, how long can I buy seed, and how how long are they viable for? They can go for years, but as they get it, every year you hold them, uh, they lose a percentage of germination rate. That's why the city of Arizona wants us to test them within nine months of selling them. So we always you'll see a date on all of our seed, which we're always testing those. Uh, they would still germinate the next year, just not as well as this year. Also, keeping them cool. So whenever we've got, if we got extra cuttings or extra seed, I basically have an old refrigerator. Don't keep it plugged in. We just it's insulate it. We just put them in there and close the door. It's outside. It's kind of how we hold them, and they, they seem to germinate well for more seed. But you could do the same thing. If you're planting in May, after the freeze and thaw cycle, you can artificially create this natural freeze-thaw cycle in your own refrigerator. So just get your seed, make poppies for instance. They need to they need to freeze and thaw. Just chuck them in the freezer for a couple days. Bring them back out for a couple days. Do it one more time. Then plant it. You just created your own natural freeze freeze thaw in your own refrigerator. So you there's ways around this as gardeners. I never tell gardeners what they can or can't do because they'll find a way to make it grow. And so that's one way you could force wildflowers. If you came in May and said, I want poppies in my yard, I go, here, let me show you how to do that. Before you go plant them, throw them in the freezer. They'll think you're crazy, but it really works. So it makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. So pine needles, she's got a lot, she's in the pine forest. Will they interfere? Yes. Pine, pine needles are not your friend. Um, what pine and, and juniper do, what's your conifers, those evergreens, the reason they're shedding so much, that's a defensive mechanism. They're trying to bury under, everything underneath in their root zone. They're trying to bury them so nothing else can, can survive except their roots. And so it also insulates the soil so it doesn't freeze and thaw, keeps it moist. There's a lot of benefit to why pine trees do that. Well, they'll also bury your wildflowers. Could you rake that up and plant wildflowers? Yes, you could be very successful, but it'll kind of be a pine needle cleanup once a year to just get them just to open up that, that garden so it won't bury your plants. Things like uh, junipers. Junipers not only shed a lot, but they also poison the soil. There's arsenics and strict, there's all kinds of weird chemicals they do. You know, it's like very few things grow underneath the juniper. That's very strategic on the junipers part. It's really difficult to grow under junipers. So probably not as well underneath those. You'll find a few things will grow. Like I've had really great luck with, there was one I brought, this thing. What's the exact? This is a, a Artemisia. Uh, this is Castle, How, Howell's Castle Artemisia. Artemisia is a native plant. This thrives underneath my junipers. It gets up about, I don't know, this tall kind of spreads. like Big silver mound. Cannot kill it. Once it gets rooted, kind of take your drip emitter, put it up to the base of that. For one year, I water it, and then I cut it off of all other care. But every other year, I cut it back to the ground so it starts back fresh. You can't kill this uh, unless you overwater it. Even then, it, I, you can't kill this. It's a great native plant. And so it'll take that juniper, juniper area. Another one I've had great luck with are, uh, do I have one? They didn't bring it for me. Oh, this one. I've had great luck with this. This is Vinca or Periwinkle for you Midwest folks. We call it that. But Vinca, minor, Vinca major, gets a ground cover spreading out. It's an evergreen, gets these little blue flowers. This takes really well underneath junipers. And another native I found is, is a Oregon grape or, or Mahonia. They make a creeping one that natively grows out in, in the forest. That's where it naturally goes underneath the oaks and the junipers. So there's certain ones that will take, but I wouldn't put a mix out there. It would, it would struggle. It just wouldn't be worth the energy. So good, good question. Was there something else? How about on this side? I've already answered three of yours. And we go here, and then I'll come back. So what would Vinca do? 
This is also a weed. Um, if you're not careful, if there's a nuclear holocaust, there's only going to be ants and this plant left when it's all done. I mean, it's kind of how it's going to work. Uh, it's, it catches, grows, it does really, really well. So in riprap, I do find just gardeners. It's just gardeners talking. It looks better when you cut it back every once in a while, every two, three years. It's kind of really put your back. And if it's in riprap, or riprap is when you stack rocks to hold in a hill. It's called riprap. It would just be harder to maintain that way. But usually riprap's kind of like a, a throwaway hillside. I don't care. Just rip, keep it from washing down in my backyard. Maybe that's okay for this. Just let it grow. Yeah, so it'd be really good with that. Yeah, there's several things like that. We can go offline. I can show you quite a few things to, to help you plant that better. There was something in the back. Yes, really good question. Go. Yep. That's a, that is a good question, yeah. So pine trees, if you plant wildflowers underneath the pine trees, will the, will the wildflowers hurt the pine trees? No. First of all, pine, especially ponderosas, any pine, they got roots going to your neighbors and beyond. They're, they're all over the place. You're going to hurt those trees more by having heavy equipment, a driveway, drive over the roots than you are planting wildflowers. If anything, it's a benefit. It keeps the sun off the soil. Okay, you're probably going to water every once in a while. You're going to fertilize every once in a while. The pine tree will, will absolutely benefit from wildflowers, not be hurt. I wouldn't worry about it. If anything, the pine tree will bury your wild, your uh, wildflowers. They just kind of, you can quickly get this many this many pine needles. You folks in the pines know how, how much they a big 100-foot ponderosa can shed. It's a lot. So something else. So how sensitive are the seed to shade? Now, uh, I don't really have a, a shade mix per se. Um, what arch, at this elevation, shade, it's really not that shady. It's even in the shaded area, it's very bright. So some of your really tall flowers, like a pinstone, might start to lean towards the sun, but it will still grow and it will still bloom. I haven't found shade to be that much of a problem, but they do actually make hardcore shade uh, uh, mixes. Uh, it's mainly for the Midwest. That's where they really need it. Or East Coast. If those thick oaks and stuff, it's hard shade. Here, we're really bright. So I wouldn't worry about it so much. If not, you can put your hostas. You know, that's like a number one selling shade plant in the back. When should you trim this? So I brought a couple things here for trimming because I thought it might come up. So this you can trim right now. This will, if you trimmed it now and fertilize it with the all-purpose food, it'd probably be in bloom March 1. I mean, in just a few weeks, it'd be in bloom again. So I think it's time. It's time between now and the end of March is your peak time to prune. Fruit trees, perennials, hedges, uh, it's time to prune. And you want to get it done by the middle to the end of March. By the end of March, it is full on. It's full spring. I mean, everything is, it's going. Daffodils are in bloom, Forsythia are going. Um, I also brought this one. Doesn't look like much. Anyone know what this is? It's got a little blue flower kind of left over. Russian sage. It's like a number one seller here. It's a summer through fall bloomer. And everyone wonders, how should I prune this? So I just brought it going, oh, here's the, they, they get up about this tall or so. I don't know, blue flowers on top of that. Um, you cannot kill this. Just don't worry, but just cut it back. Cut it back hard. It'll grow, then fertilize. Fertilize your way out of any mistake. You know, just come right back at it. So same with salvia or autumn sage. It's got a red flower to it. Um, I've not started to prune mine back quite yet. I'll let this next cold cycle go, and then towards the end of February, March, I'll kind of prune those just to make... They look a little rough at first when you first prune them, but if I prune them towards the end of February, they, they just, they're they just going to grow almost within the next week. They just start growing. So anyway, it's, it's time to prune. Be careful of things like lilacs, forsythia, flowering quince, rhododendrons, azaleas. These early spring bloomers, don't prune those. You can prune them. It's just 
you'll lose all the flowers. Well, the reason you plant a beautiful lilac is for that fragrance and big flowers. If you prune it back now, you cut off all the flower buds. It's been forming flower buds since last summer. So kind of wait. You usually prune those things right after they're done, done blooming, okay? Let me just go over because we could go all day. and We're getting close. I'm almost to an hour. I know those seeds are getting cold and hard. Let me just go down a couple things here that I brought that I think wildflower growers would kind of find interesting. And I'll start down here. This is my new favorite plant. This is Euphorbia, Rainbow Ascot Euphorbia. This is a perennial. It's an evergreen perennial. Mine at home are about this tall, they're kind of vase-shaped, and they just have this beautiful shape, and they're, they're this color in winter, right out there. So I've got them in the ground, I've got them in raised beds, I've got them in containers. A beautiful container plant, because it's just so shapely. An evergreen, very few perennials will do that. This is a, a it's kind of like a succulent, it's got a really uh, moist stem system, very fibrous root mass, so it's very tough. It's kind of like a yucca, something like that. It's very, very robust. Uh, this is lavender. We got our first crop of, of some of the herbal. So the winter blooming plants are starting to cycle in now. This is one that just came in, but lavenders do really, really well. They're evergreen. This is one that has the, that blue flower that hovers on top. It's got that real fragrant kind of lavender scent. Animals don't like herbs. They're not going to eat uh, uh, rosemaries, lavenders. They just don't like it. But hummingbirds love it. Yeah, butterflies love them. So this is a little great one. Again, this one does. I've killed a couple lavenders, and it's always because I, I watered them too much. They were in the soil. It just didn't perk. It didn't drain very well, and then they suffer. They do really well in raised beds, containers, sandier soil, someplace where it really drains well, and then you ignore it. That's how you're going to grow a nice rosemary or a nice lavender. So anyway, just brought it going, okay, that's how you use that one. Um, real quick, these came in yesterday. Uh, get rid of that. This is a new one. This is called Chieftain. This is Chieftain um, Manzanita. It's a little bit bigger. It's a, it's a strain of our local Manzanita. Only gets just a little bit taller. So it can almost be a mini tree. But it still has that same red bark, evergreen, and they're starting starting to flower. You, you see, okay, it's not quite flowering yet, but it will. In February, March, it's got that classic bell-shaped manzanita flower. Anyway, it's a pretty evergreen. Those get eight feet tall. These get shorter. This is Panchito. Um, this one gets uh, about like this. It's actually an easier one to care for. So many man's that get too big. They're too happy here. So they start to take over their space more than you want. You kind of want them by the walkway, but they just kind of look good all the time. When they start to go overgrow their space, they're kind of a nuisance. Plant this one out by the back fence where you want to soften it. Plant these two by the walkway, entrance, that kind of stuff. But truly a native. Uh, Man's need to grow wild here. In Prescott Valley, be careful you don't kill them. They don't like that heavy clay soil. So there you just amend it more. A little secret I found from my Prescott Valley, Chino, that, the ranch you have by Hills area, that heavy clay areas. Um, let me take a swig here. I killed a lot of plants when I first started gardening out there. But I started to plant like this. I would leave about two, three inches of root out of the ground, and I would mound the soil slightly up to cover up that root. That way, when you get your monsoon rains, mainly in the summer is when you're going to kill them, you'll be irrigating them, and then you'll get a monsoon rain, and literally it'll, it'll saturate the soil, and it'll start to root rot on you. That's how these things die. So if you just leave a little bit of root out of the ground, it ensures no matter how much moisture you get, at least that much of the root can breathe. It's like leaving your nose up out of a pool. It really is a game changer for all evergreens, natives, that kind of stuff out there. Um, not so much wildflowers, doesn't really pertain, but just a little secret. Again, I don't want you to kill plants. I want you to be successful. And that really helped out uh, in, my, in, in, in the gardens. So I got a friend that grows these. 
these are really hard to grow. This is probably about a three-year-old plant. And so they tend to, the crop failure as you're rooting them out is pretty high. So growers don't like to grow these because you want 100% take. You don't want to waste your energy and time and resources. For three years, have 20% of the crop fail. You only harvest 80%. You want 100%. So there's not many people want to touch this. But I got a friend who's obsessive compulsive. He's a gardener. He said, don't tell me what I can grow and can't grow. And he came out, he figured out how to grow these. So these are fully rooted plants you can plant out in the yard. I was able to snag 200 of them. That's all I'm probably going to get. That seems like that's a lot. It's really not. I have 45,000 customers go through here this year. 200 plants is not that much. So when you see them, so, so, the half of you that are new to the area, you'll see this swell of, of inventory. You'll see crop harvesting. We'll, we'll harvest the crops. You'll see me here and go, oh, that's so pretty. I think I'm going to need three of those. I'm going to go home and think about it. By the time you come in next weekend, there won't be any left. I'm not, I'm not pressuring you. Just telling you that's how it sort. That's how crops work. Everyone thinks it's like Walmart. You hit a button, you get another widget at the other end. Plants aren't that way, especially as you get into like peonies, these really specialty crops. They can take years to form to get up to where it's an actual plant where it can. So you will we'll have, I don't know, a couple hundred peonies show up in March. They'll be just the eyes will just start to be coming up. They aren't quite growing yet. They're in a bloom, but once peonies start growing, they grow really fast. Um, and then they'll go. I'll have maybe two dozen colors, and then they'll quickly start to fade. Will start to run out. So just kind of be aware of that as you see it. And so have a good plan, but then buy it when you're ready. Just be ready. There are uh, this whole uh, supply chain thing. It's real. So and I, I just got our, our this mulch bag, or the, these kind of our, our, our topsoil, potting soil. We, we make our own soils. They're all organic. They're all locally sourced. It's all the things you want. Um, I couldn't get the brown film that the bags go into. Like the simplest, stupidest thing. It took forever. It took me two months of work to get the film piece of it. We're finally going to get it. In, we got enough bags being printed to last a season, but it's the weirdest thing. I couldn't get a, a neem oil. We love neem oil. It's organic bug control. I had the neem, had the bottle, had the label. I couldn't get the spray spritzer top. There were like 20,000 of them off the coat, off in a container in LA. You couldn't get the one part to make it go. Uh, and then what's really happening is this COVID thing, you get 20% of your crew out. So at any given time, all the factories, everyone is running at 80% capacity. They're, just because the staff, you can't have them for five days while they got, while they're recovering. Uh, they always come back, but it's it's causing issues. So it's, this whole thing's kind of real. You'll see it with your seed. So grab your seed, especially vegetable seeds. Don't wait until the season. Get them now because there's going to be a shortage. They already shorted me. Uh, we got our 2022 seed, the initial load that are down there. They shorted me. Uh, we we over-ordered, but they just shorted so many of them. Uh, and I don't know why. It's like unique to this year. Why would that happen? It's, it's a supply thing so this thing that you're hearing about it we're we're dealing with it on a local level and you'll see that play out in your you see it in the grocery store kind of stuff with that we are one hour and five minutes in i will take three more questions one from this side one from this side and one from either prescott valley or here so since you seem to dominate the the questions no yeah up front up front doing great i love it Nope, you don't. So once she's got it all out, do we need to put anything else over it to keep the birds off? You water it. The water will actually get it to settle down and get it into the soil and make it go. The mulch that you've got, this is enough to keep the birds. They got to really work to get through this and find that seed. It's almost too much work for them. So no, I would not say do not put additional manure, additional anything else on top of this. Don't put bark over it. You could bury some of the seed need to be exposed to sun. Some don't. You, you could affect the germination rate by putting more stuff. So don't, this is enough. Yeah, don't, don't, don't go all gardener on it. Give it more love. It could affect it. 
the proportions of each. It's really forgiving. The main thing that you really want to watch is the right seed per 100 square feet. Get that right. And then the more mulch you have, the better. I just buy a bag, put a wheelbarrow and go. Um, this is my favorite garden tool right here. These big rubber tubs, these are great. I use them for everything. I've, I've mixed up wildflowers in this. Not quite as easy to get a shovel into, but I've used it. Easier to spread though. So um, I would say it doesn't matter the amount of mulch. When you're doing fertilizers, always use the recommended rate. So this covers 2,000 square feet. Don't use all of this on a 100 square foot patch of flowers. It's too much. It'll burn it. Uh, the things I told you about the manure, don't use manure. That'll burn it. So things like that. So, uh, but other than that, the proportions are, they're, they're pretty forgiving. In the back, yeah. Yeah, welcome Chino, right on. How many people are from Chino? Only one, you're our token Chino people. There's others here, they just are afraid to put their hand up because I might call them out. <laughs> yeah. So the Chino folks, you folks online, um, are, is the Chino soil the same as the Dewey soil? As the whale? Is, we're all kind of the same zone. We all grow the same, we all see the same storms. We all have the same snow. It can vary a little bit depending on what side of the granite mountain you're on, but we all are the same. What you get is Chino Valley has the worst soil in the entire county. Up on the new areas, those new new subdivisions, terrible soil. The old farmland is beautiful. So it depends on the older properties. Those are all developed and done. The newer subdivisions are going up where the vistas are really pretty, but the soil is even worse. So it just depends on where you're at. You're going to have to prep your soil. Soil is everything. So if you get that soil right, gardening is easy. You try to take shortcuts. It really starts to struggle. You know, in the back. Yep. Nope. Go ahead. So what's wrong with adding this and the fertilizer into this mix? It's harder to control. I guess you could. It's just harder to control, and it's just one more thing to kind of, I find it's easier to put it in my handheld spreader and just go, oh, I'm all done. It makes me feel like I'm spreading fairy dust over my garden bed. It just feels better. It just, and, it, and you can be more accurate, more precise with your, with your addition. This is a nitrogen source. This is bird guano. It's the main ingredient for nitrogen and, and, and cottonseed meal and some other stuff. Um, bird guano is hot. So it's really hot. So if you get too much, you can burn things. But you just want to be more exact. That's the only reason. So with that, I think I've got, I could cover some more. We could keep going. I'll just hang out. If you've got other questions, come up, take a look at the plants as you want. I'll release you. Look for an email coming your way with how to fertilize, when to fertilize, and what to fertilize with, and then wildflower handouts. You'll have two handouts in your inbox It'll be a PDF format, so you can open it with anything, a phone, a tablet, or, or, or a laptop. Uh, so it's coming your way. And I'll just hang out with more questions, okay? Thanks for coming, you all. What's that? Yes, very much. Yeah, very much established plants. Let me just get these out of the way just so...